Hey everyone, it's Kenji, and I'm gonna make some schnitzel. So I'm making um, Vienna style schnitzel. This is um, based on uh, my most recent New York Times column. Um, so it's not Wiener schnitzel. It's not made with veal. Um, although, so if if this is made with veal, then it would be Wiener schnitzel. Um, it's not, so we're just gonna call it plain schnitzel. But we're gonna do it in the sort of Viennese style, where um, the goal is to have a kind of puffed up very light crust where the meat kind of steams in a pocket inside um it's different from how you would get schnitzel in most of the sort of you know breaded and fried cutlet eating parts of the world it's different from like a milanesa different from how they have schnitzel in germany different from katsu but so the goal here is to get the crust to separate um and we're going to do a few things to get there um i'm starting with pork loin um because it uh, it has a nice smooth structure, which makes it really ideal for cutting cutlets. And I'm going to butterfly mine, which means I'm going to first cut it down to right around there. You don't have to do this butterflying. The only reason you do this is if you want one nice larger cutlet to fry. So you cut it almost all the way through, leave it, leave it attached by like a half inch, and then cut all the way through next to it. See, and then I can butterfly this other one. Although I think I'm only going to do one cutlet right now for, for demo's sake. Right there, now we got two butterfly cutlets. And so now what we're gonna do is we're going to pound. There we go. So I got a sheet of parchment. Uh, you can use plastic wrap, you can use an old grocery bag, a zipper lock bag, as long as it's kind of protected. And then if you've got a meat mallet, you can do that, but I don't, so I'm just gonna use a saucepan. And the trick here is not to go too firmly. Use kind of like the heel of it and be a little bit gentle. You want to kind of coax it out into a shape rather than using full brute force. Um, and by the time we're done here, it should end up about twice as long as it was and twice as wide as it, wide as it was. So four times the total surface area and a quarter the total thickness. So you can see I'm kind of like trying to spread it out evenly pounding it across the surface not just not just giving it you know hard wax to get into place pick it up and see how we're doing yep we can go probably about twice that so if by the way you don't want your crust to stick to your skin i'm going to tell you throughout the process of making this i'm going to be telling you points where you can do something slightly different um, and get very different results as far as sort of crust adhesion and the puffiness go. But if you've never had sort of the, um, you know, the, the real Viennese style puffy coated schnitzel, um, I think you should try it because it's, even if it sounds weird, like it sounds like something you might not want, like why would you, why would you want your crust to separate from the meat? I know people are going to ask. Um, try it and you'll find out. It just has a very sort of unique texture to it much lighter and sort of crisp as opposed to as opposed to crunchier which is what you get with the more well-tiered crust all right i think we're getting close to good at least good enough for now we could keep going but i'm satisfied am i am i now yeah, let me go a tiny tiny bit thinner So you see we have a nice smooth surface and that's going to help that crust separate. If we wanted to get that crust to stick, one thing you can do is take the back of your knife and whack, 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 and give it some texture. Um, I saw that at a, on a video from Mangchi who uh, did it for her Korean style breaded cutlets. Um, all right, next we got breadcrumbs. So these are, this is a, a few slices of bread that I have that I've started grinding in here. You can do store-bought breadcrumbs, um, you can use panko, you can use whatever breadcrumbs you have. The only things that you need to be sure of are that the bread is super, super dry. So this one I dried overnight um, sitting on the counter. You can do it in the oven, but as long as the bread is super dry um, and then super finely ground. So I'll show you what we're gonna do. We're gonna grind it in this mini chopper. You can also use a food processor. But you basically let it run
for a few minutes. And I had this running before. I'm not going to make you sit through it, but I, you know, total of a couple minutes. And then you take your fine mesh strainer. You get your crumbs in there. There you go. And so super fine. This super fine crumb is, is actually really important to getting that puffed, you know, souffled crust because it forms a really nice tight seal with the eggs. Um, so if you wanted, you know, something that's a little crunchier and doesn't don't care about that puffing, um, don't grind your don't grind your crumbs as much um, or use something like, you know, panko, which are designed to be extra crunchy. Um, this stuff, by the way, you can you can regrind it. Um, so I'm going to put it back in the grinder and I'll regrind it and use it later. So you can keep regrinding and sifting until you get pretty much all of it out, um, you know, sort of diminishing returns eventually. Uh, all right. So we got our bread layer. Let's do our eggs. Um, some recipes will call for adding oil or cream or milk to the eggs. Um, I found that it can help a little bit, but it's not totally essential. Um, you know, if you want to add a little splash of oil to your eggs, it's not going to hurt it. You know, you can take like a little... Well, if you have any oil left, yeah, a little drizzle of oil or a little dash of cream in there. Um, and that'll help the eggs sort of, um, and what it does is it basically um, prevents the egg proteins from binding as tightly the same way that like adding fat to, um, you know, bread dough enriches it and makes it softer. Um, it'll, it, it, it winds up making the egg layer a little bit more uh, elastic and stretchy so that when your crust starts to puff, um, it's less, less likely to get holes. But like I said, it makes a, a small, small difference. So if you want to skip it, it's not going to hurt you too much. All right. You don't need to beat the eggs too much. You can if you want. It doesn't hurt it. Um, but you don't need to. And top layer is flour. Um, so the, in Austria, there is a specific type of sort of coarse, more coarsely ground flour that gets used here. Um, I tried a whole bunch of different flours, including whole wheat, rye, uh, semolina, um, I can't remember, a few, a few different other types of flours. Basically, any, any kind of flour and starch I could find, I tried it. Um, Wondra, and I found that it didn't actually make that much of a difference. So I'm just sticking with regular all-purpose flour here. All right, so the last bit, and this is sort of the key to the whole thing, that you need some booze. I'm gonna go with a little bit of a, a little whiskey. Um, I tested this with vodka, but I, I ran out of the bottle that I was using. Um, any booze will work. Um, so the key here is that when you've got your cutlet, um, which, by the way, you shouldn't bread until right before you're about to fry it. Um, so don't pre-bread your cutlets. Uh, what happens is, if you do that, the um, the breadcrumb layer starts to absorb too much liquid from the egg yolks, uh, and it ends up um, that then that makes the whole top breading layer cook unevenly. So you get a sort of sp spotty, not very appetizing fried look to it. Um, so you want to bread it only just before you're about to start frying it which means you gotta have everything ready. So, all right, salt and pepper. I'm gonna check my oil temperature here. I like to use a wok. Um, you can use a deep Dutch oven, or if you want, you know, traditionally this would be done in a sort of straight-sided saute pan, but, you know, if you don't wanna get oil, run the risk of getting oil on top of your uh, counter, I would not recommend that. Uh, we're a little bit hot, 410 degrees, 412 degrees. Um, I would normally, ideally, like to do this between 375 and 400, but even 410 is fine. Um, this is just grapeseed oil in here right now. Um, I, w I have done it with clarified butter and I've done it with lard. Both are great and both had great flavor. So if you want to do one of those, um, I would highly recommend it. Um, clarified brown butter is actually really good. All right. Um, what else do I have ready? I've got this fine mesh uh, dipper for clearing out sort of uh, flour particles and bits of breadcrumbs and scum uh, between batches. I've got this pan ready with a with a um, paper towel in it for when the schnitzel cooks because it, it, all, it all cooks really fast. So you gotta be ready for it. All right, so 
Some recipes for traditional schnitzel will tell you to spray the schnitzel with water before you do the breading. And what happens is that um, that water evaporates and that's what causes that sort of puffiness, the, um, the souffle to occur. Um, what I found is that if you want even more puffiness, instead of using just plain water, um, use a bit of liquor. So it can be whiskey in this case, or it could be something like um, vodka. Vodka, you know, will have a neutral flavor, but honestly, the flavor doesn't really come through that much anyhow. Um, so the alcohol here is more volatile than water, which means that it um, evaporates much more vigorously and easily once it hits that oil. So it creates a sort of, you'll see it happen. You'll see, I'll show you. All right. And of course, conversely, if you want your crust to stick, dry your cutlet very carefully before dredging it. Um, and the drier it is, you know, press it between paper towels, the drier it is, the more likely it is that your uh, crust is going to stick to it without puffing out. I'm gonna try and get nice, even coverage. Don't wanna to press too hard because we don't really want it adhering. We just wanna make a nice, even layer. Give it a little shake. All right, into our eggs. Again, you need to make sure it's nice and even, that everything is covered. Okay. Then into our crumbs. And now this is the part where you really don't want to press much at all. That's all we need. Okay. Get a towel ready for my fingers. Give it a shake. And you always put it in draping it away from you. Wipe your fingers. Now here's the other key. You want to immediately start agitating it. You need that oil constantly moving um, not only does this make sure that the uh, cutlet is constantly sort of exposed to fresh oil so that it stays nice and hot um, during its cook time, but it also um, sort of coaxes the crust to separate from the, uh, from the meat. Okay, now here's where we should see it really start puffing. Let's see what happens if we flip. I'm starting to see some puffing. Oh yeah, look at all that puffing there. That's what we're looking for. Puffing, puffing, puffing. Nice golden waves, sort of like, well, I say it's like the skin of a Sharpe. Let's flip this one more time. And the total cooking time for this is about, about two minutes. Not much more than that. Look at that puff. All right, this is looking pretty much done. Nice and golden all over. And then I want to put it straight into my paper towel pan. And then blot its top surface a little bit. There we go. All right.
This looks pretty perfect to me. Let's go get our beauty shot, eh? All right, so how do we do? What we want to see is sort of a puffy, almost cavernous crust around a thin, gently steamed cutlet. And that is exactly what we see. Beautiful. It gives it such a light, incredibly light texture that you really don't expect from a fried uh, meat dish. But that's what makes the style of mm. schnitzel so exceptional. What do you think, Shabu? What do you think? Come on. Sit. Good girl. Good boy. All right. Let me get one more piece of that uh, internal crust structure. All right. Schnitzel. Guys, gals, non-binary pals. Uh, there you go. I'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Hey everyone, it's Kenji. There are 22 million kids in this country that rely on school lunches for nutritious meals. And with schools closed now more than ever, organizations like No Kid Hungry can use their support. So I'm asking you to join me. Uh, click the link in the description below to donate some money. No amount is too small or too big. Thank you very much and stay safe. Bye-bye.